Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is the uh, special meeting of the Board of Fire Commissioners. Uh, today is February 1st, 2022, and the time is 9 a.m. Ms. Gomez, will you the roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. What's Gray? Here. Babcock? Hara? Here. Ibarra? Here. Ninberg? Here. Fire Chief Terrazas? Here. Deputy City Attorney Wen? Here. You have a quorum? Thank you very much. Um, Chief Terrazas, would you do the flag salute and a moment of silence for us, please? Absolutely. Please stand right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag. The flag of the United States America. of America. And to the Republic. The Republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty for all. Now please join me in a moment of silence and honor past and present members of the Los Angeles City Fire Department who devoted their lives to the protection of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Tarasas. Okay, we're at um, Ms. Gomez. Would you give us the rules and for uh, conducting the meeting? Yes, persons may listen to this meeting live by dialing any of the telephone numbers listed on the cover of the agenda for this meeting. Should you dial one of these numbers, you will be able to listen to the meeting, but will not be able to give public comment during the meeting. Anyone wishing to address the Board of Fire Commissioners on any item on the agenda or to provide general public comment shall call 1-669-900-9126. When you are asked for a meeting ID, please enter 881-2091-3045, followed by the pound sign. Then press the pound sign again to continue. You will then be joined into the meeting. To alert the board that you want to give public comment, press star 9. You will be called on by board staff, who may refer to you using the last three digits of the number you are calling from. When unmuted by staff, press star 6 and please state your name. As a general reminder, public comment will be limited to one minute per item and up to two minutes allowed for agenda items. At the request of the speaker, the speaker will be afforded an additional one minute for general public comment for a maximum of three minutes total per speaker. Time cannot be ceded to another speaker and an individual may speak only once during the public comment period. Only those who are in the queue when the president begins the public comment section of the agenda will be allowed to speak. These instructions may also be found on the front page of the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gomez. Number, uh, item one is commissioner comments. Are there commissioner com comments from the commissioners? I'll start off by saying that uh, February is a month of many celebrations, and uh, this month we will celebrate Black History Month, which should be celebrated every day, and uh, the Lunar New Year begins. So we wish everyone great celebrations, uh, an opportunity to get to know new information, and to familiarize yourself with old information. Uh, perhaps the uh, Centurions will do a, a, a celebration at the uh, next meeting on the firefighters and the experiences that relate to Black history. Uh, okay. Uh, and, of course, we've celebrated our Rams. Go Rams. Win Rams. I don't want them to go. I want them to win. Win Rams. <laughs> That's my newest slogan, win Rams. We used to say, go Rams, go. No, it's win, Rams, win. Um, and so we we are all having fun with that. Um, are there other comments from other commissioners? Okay, so then we shall move on to uh, the report of the fire chief. Good morning, Chief Tarasa. Good morning, Madam President. Uh, sticking with the theme of the uh, big uh, Rams win, uh, which happened on Sunday. Um, 
we approved, I approved the optional wearing of Rams caps with all for all on duty uh, members. And then yesterday I called the Cincinnati Fire Chief, Chief Michael Washington, who, ha who happens to be a leadership academy graduate of our LAFD Leadership Academy. But I made a friendly wager and the losing uh, chief has to do the following. They have to raise the flag uh, above their one of their downtown fire stations. The losing chief has to wear the jersey of the winning team. And then um, their busiest engine has to carry the flag on their apparatus for 24 hours. Oh, my. And then the losing uh, city has to do a congratulatory video and post it on their social media. Uh, we did this a few years ago with the Patriots when the Rams were in, in the Super Bowl. We were not successful then, but I fully anticipate we're going to win on February 13th. Well, sounds like fun. <laughs> that concludes my report. Okay. Very good. Sounds like fun. Lots of fun. Um, now we're at num item number three, which is public comment. Ms. Uh, Gomez, how many hands do we I see three. I don't know. Mm -hmm. four. One just popped up. Another just popped yeah, up. Yeah, so there are four. Five there now. Four? Five. Five. Now sometimes, I see five. Yeah, okay. some, sometimes there's okay. a little delay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. And they have a hard time getting through some of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. We're at five. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Gomez, are you starting? Yes. Okay. I've requested to unmute for oh, okay. number 444 ending. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, will you oh, be good. speaking on general public comment or specific agenda items? I'm going to be uh, speaking on all items. Okay, very well. Um, you have three minutes, please. Okay. So my name is Jessica Craven. Um, I am a Los Angeles resident and member of the LACDP uh, elected member in, in AD 50, well, now AD 52, used to be AD 51. Um, and I've been following the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the controversy, the issues in the fire department with, um, um, you know, abuse and harassment. And I guess I just want to say that um, I'm hearing that the, the union president, um, Mr. Escobar, has been sort of disputing the findings of the workplace assessment study that concluded there was bullying and harassment at the department. And he said that there is no systemic problem of issues regarding gender or race at the fire department. And I, I guess I find that as someone who has experienced sexual assault, as I think that you know many, many people have, um, women in particular, it's really hard to hear someone who is the president of the L.A. Firefighter Union gaslighting the members he's representing, basically saying you didn't experience what you just experienced. Um, so I guess I just want to repeat a couple of statistics that 56 percent of sworn females selected bullying and harassment and perceived discrimination as a source of conflict compared to 19 percent of men. 47 percent of African-Americans perceived discrimination significantly higher than other ethnicity groups. Um, and these statistics mirror former assessments uh, done of the department or its members in 2015, in 20, uh, 2007, in 2006. So when the president of the firefighters union says there's no systemic problem of issues regarding gender or race, he is basically discounting the voices of the members he represents. Um, and even worse, he is working against his members' best interests. So um, I guess, you know, what we would like to see is a third party assessment of the academy similar to like the Deloitte study so that our new chief um, who you know we're, we're cautiously optimistic about but but can use that as a roadmap for reform of the academy and make it truly equitable for all um, and this will save our taxpayers millions of dollars it will improve our diversity numbers and actually sure, we yeah. might have a workforce that reflects the city it serves and most importantly, create a positive work environment for all. Uh, it's not okay to be told that the things that happened to us didn't happen to us by someone who is not in a position to make that determination. So let's go forward with transparency, openness, and acknowledgement of what has happened. That's the only way we can fix it. Um, anyone who's 
recovered from anything, knows that you cannot recover by denying the past. Uh, you recover by acknowledging it, making you know whatever kind of amends and fixes that you can, and then going on with a commitment to doing better. So um, that's all for me, and thanks for uh, letting me speak. Thank you for your comments. Number ending in 403, I've requested that you unmute. Good morning. Please state the item yeah. or items that you will be speaking to and your name at the beginning, please. Uh, general public comment and item 6C. You have two minutes. My name is Libby. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Libby. I'm calling because I'm concerned about the bullying and harassment that seems to be plaguing the LASD. An LA Times article from a couple of weeks ago cites the recent workplace culture survey results showing that more than half the female firefighters reported bullying and harassment. I found it stunning that the president of the firefighters union, who should have the backs of all firefighters, was denying there was a bullying and harassment problem in the department. The report that is to be received today on diversity and retention rates, retention rates for recruits seems to indicate a similar problem. The report is self-congratulatory regarding the probation year retention rate of those that graduate from the academy, but it remains silent and provides no explanation for the huge percentage of female recruits that don't graduate. In 2019, only 59% of women graduated in comparison to 92% of men. In 2020, only 55% of women graduated in comparison to 89% of men. I'd like to know more about the experience of those female recruits, and I hope you do too. Does the culture of bullying and harassment start at the academy? Maybe there should be a culture study at the academy. Of those that make it through the academy and probation, they, still, they often still face an intolerable work environment, as indicated by the survey results leaving us with an abysmal retention rate of only 53% of female firefighters hired in the last seven years. Of course, you are supposed to be the stewards of our tax dollars. When hiring and training of a new firefighter, firefighter costs in the neighborhood of $125,000 each, you are wasting millions of our dollars when the fully trained female fighters don't want to stay on the job. It's time to do better. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Number ending in 108, I've asked that you unmute. Good morning, please state morning. the agenda item or items you'll be speaking to and your name at the beginning. Thank you. General public comment and items 6C and 6D. Thank you, you have three minutes in your name. Good morning, uh, Commission President. Madam President, Vice President, Fire Chief Terrazas, Command Staff. My name is Chris Larson. I'm President of Los Angeles Women in the Fire Service. I'm looking over these numbers for our gender breakdowns for the board report for recruits. And I'm a little concerned that we have some work to do as far as it relates to African Americans, Filipinos, Asians, and women. Um, looking at the numbers of our projected vacancies, we can't afford to have a 59% retention rate for women or less, or 74% uh, attrition rate in the academy for African Americans. Um, we need to get as many members hired and through the academy without compromising the standards, knowing that we face large numbers of retirements. And it's going to be important that we have the ability to survey the members that exit the academy the members that graduate from the academy to see how we do them in educating them and training them to become productive members of the fire department. And I would urge the commissioners to work with the fire chief to get another survey done to figure out where we can better improve our services to the recruits and make them the quality members that they will be when they get through probation. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Number ending in 253. I've requested that you unmute. Good morning. What agenda item or items will you be speaking to? And please identify yourself at the beginning. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. I'm uh, speaking to general public comment item 60. My name is Robert Hawkins. Good morning, General Public Comment and 6C. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam President, all Fire Commissioners, Fire Chief Terrazas, Fire Chief Crowley, and everyone in attendance. My name is Robert Hawkins. I'm the Executive Vice President representing the Centurions. 
I would first like to recognize the start of Black History Month and the history of Black firefighters in the LAFD. The Stentorians was formed in 1954 to combat racial injustice and inequalities faced by African-American firefighters. Since then, our mission has developed into recruitment, retention, and promotion. Our history is highlighted in a book entitled The Old Centurions. With that being said, I'll be remiss if I didn't address the annual recruit training report this morning. On page four of this report, it shows African-Americans with a 74% retention rate and females with a 59% rate. We must do better. This statistic is by no means the LAFD standard. In the same report on the last page, it states that the LAFD is recognized, <coughs> Novata's excellent, and the training academy is evolving and adapting to changes. Well, if this is true, the Centurions is calling for, and we strongly encourage the use of surveys to bolster opportunities and a higher success rate. We ask the Fire Commission to strongly consider this option. Thank you, I yield. Thank you for your comments. Number ending in 105. I've requested that you unmute. Number ending 105. Again, I've requested that you unmute. Good morning. Please state your name for the record and the agenda item or items you will be speaking to. Uh, all items, Freddie Escobar. Three minutes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Freddie Escobar, President of the United Firefighters of Los Angeles City, Local 112, representing over 3,400 brothers and sisters of the LAFD. LAFD continues to face an enormous staffing crisis that needs to be addressed immediately. Every single day for <clears throat> at least the past month, the LFD has been forced to close multiple resources throughout the city because of our staffing shortages. Here are fire trucks, engines, and ambulance operating on our street means longer emergency response time, which puts everyone's safety in jeopardy. Our firefighters and paramedics are being forced to work longer hours, and it's taken a toll on both their physical and mental health. Our current way of operating is not sustainable and we're at a breaking point. These past two years have been particularly challenging, but this staffing crisis has been years in the making. From 2008 to 2013, our department didn't hire a single firefighter, and we are still feeling the impact of this five years, five year hiring freeze. Simply put, we cannot afford to lose any more firefighters. The problem is only getting worse as more and more firefighters leave due to unexpected early retirement, suspension, or termination. We cannot lose any more members, including the members on the mandate. Let's work together, keeping our experienced and dedicated men and women in the department, and let's keep hiring the most qualified individuals without sacrificing fire department standards, period. The past several drill tower classes have been extremely diverse, and most importantly, they have produced highly qualified new firefighters while maintaining the high standards of the LAFD. To overcome staffing crisis for the long term, we need to continue hiring new firefighters on year-round basis. UFLEC has worked closely with Chief Terrazas to increase our hiring, and we are looking forward to working with Chief Crowley in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Is that the last speaker, uh, Ms. Gomez? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, thank everyone. I thank everyone for your comments, and uh, public comment is important to me. Uh, <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is item four. It's the determination under the government code section 54953E1. Um, is there any discussion of this item? Is there a motion? 
I move to continue item. Pardon me. Oh, hello. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yes. I move to continue item 4A for another 30 days. As a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we continue uh, in our virtual state for another 30 days, according to uh, the code section 54953E1. Um, Ms. Gomez, would you do a roll call, please? What's gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. Ibarra? Aye. Inver? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Thanks. Let's move on to the next item. Item five is the consent agenda items. Are there any um, <clears throat> concerns about any A, B, or C? Or is there a motion to uh, approve, to receive and file, or to carry out the actions of the consent agenda items? I make a motion to move five A. Oops, you kind of broke up. Was that 5A, B, and C? Yes, 5A, B, and C. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved and seconded that we um, approve item 5, consent agenda items. Ms. Gomez, would you do roll call, please? Ms. Gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. Farah? Aye. Ninberg? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, very good. We're now at item six, which is the regular agenda items. And uh, item A, <clears throat> regarding brush clearance, assessment, appeals. Uh, I'm not sure who's doing the report. There are two items there. Good morning, uh, Madam President. Good morning, uh, President Woodsgrave, Vice President Hara, Commissioners, uh, Chief Terrazas, City Attorney Wynn and Leticia. My name is Orrin Saunders. I'm the Acting Deputy Chief and Fire Marshal for the Fire Prevention and Public Safety Bureau. The Fire Good Prevention morning. Bureau. Good morning. The Fire Prevention Bureau has had a successful brush clearance season, and today I'll be introducing Captain Adrian Vasquez, as the Action Section Commander for the Industrial Commercial Section that oversees our brush clearance unit, who will be presenting our regular agenda items A and B this morning. Thank you. Good morning, President Woods, Gray, Commissioners, Chief Terrazas. Hope Good morning. Having, hope you're all having a lovely day. So I'm here to present two items. One of them is going to be the Brush Clearance Assessment Appeals. That's going to be the smaller book that you see, approximately 68 pages. These are all the appeals from constituents and property owners that have filed an appeal, have been heard through a hearing officer, and either granted or denied. This has been done at the completion of our brush season, and at this time we're hoping we move forward by getting this approved so we can claim the revenue of $296,942. And that would be just for 6A. Would you like me to go on with Is 6A? that only for, is that for 2020 only? Uh, um, it wasn't, there, this is, these are not the ones you get in 2021. No, these are 2020, President. Um, I, I have a, uh, there seems to be a, a, a large number of them, um, of, of the property uh, sites. Uh, is there any reason why we have more this year than any other year? On the, the brush assessment appeal, that's a smaller book. There is currently 68, and out of those 68 appeals, 26 were granted. Um, I can't really come up with the actual conclusion on why there was more appeals this go around other than maybe more people home due to COVID. They were able to be home and see the inspections occur or not occur. Mm -hmm. On the, on the, um, I noticed that, I don't know, this, I may be on the wrong report, where the, uh, some people said they, because of COVID, they had difficulty clearing. And, um, we know that COVID did interfere with a lot of uh, activities throughout the, uh, was any consideration given to the people who said that they had difficulty because of COVID? Uh, President Woods, yes. If we look at the boards, each person that filed an appeal 
There's a written documentation on whether it was granted or denied. A lot of them, if they were able to prove hardships, they were granted their appeal. And if you scroll through some of them, it will say granted, they proved and provided hardship. Right. So we assisted them. Like I said, the main goal of this program is not to collect revenue and charge. It's to do prevention and have a safer city. And to have, uh, to have a safe city. You're right about that. Uh-huh. Uh, what do we do about dumping uh, by unknown people on properties? When, when the owners clean up their properties and then someone goes down and dumps, dumps on it, which is a real problem in our city. So ultimately, the property owners held responsible for everything in their parcel. Um, as far as I know, I can't answer that question, Miss, on what happens when they dump. The property owner is ultimately held responsible for anything within his parcel. So even if other people dump on it after they've cleaned it up and they don't realize that somebody's dumped on it. Right. They still are responsible. They're still responsible, Miss. Hmm. I noticed that also that the hearings were held in Van Nuys. It, that seems to be a need to, would, if, I think that would be a need to have one in, in the city someplace. So for the future, could we look at that having uh, maybe two? People that live in the city have to go to Van Nuys? Yes. The only place we have the hearings are here at the Marvin Broad in San Fernando Valley. Oh. Earthquake. Earthquake, yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow. That was kind of strong. That was a nice joke. Sure yes. was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. It, it means it was felt in a lot of different places, you know. Up on the 18th floor, we felt it. Okay. So we're it's all over the whole city, I guess, because I'm over in the Crenshaw District. Mm -hmm. Dr. Har, are you in the Valley? Yes. And did you feel it? A little bit, yeah. Just a little. Oh, so it may be closer to where I am and where than where you are. Mm -hmm. so we've had a lot of problems with earthquake thoughts over this way. <clears throat> okay, uh, but about the the only place you can have it is at the Browdy Center. Uh, That's where we have it right now to have one point, so we don't have to worry about two logistical points. But if, if uh, the Board of Fire Commissioners wish to have it in two locations, that is something we can look into, President. Well, I'm just thinking that if you have people who have property all over the city of LA and which starts in San Pedro. Right. And then you have the people in Mount Washington area. And then I know realize that I probably less well and right and some and the valley, uh, that it might be more convenient to, for people if they it do people always show up for these hearings? No, these are the appeals. So only certain people that have been charged and are fighting their charges will sign up for an appeal and get a hearing date. So out of the so do they always show up? Yes, they do show up. They have a time frame that's slotted for them. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But all people from all over the city will show up to this location. It just seems an inconvenience to me that we would have just one uh, when the city is so large that we'd have only one location for a, for a for the people for any people to show up for a hearing or an appeal or to present themselves. Uh, when they're having an issue. Just like we have bureaus throughout the whole city, which is much more convenient for our organization, I think that it would just be something that we should look at for the future, having another site somewhere away from the valley where people could present their appeals or defend themselves or whatever they're doing. We'll look into that present with Gray and uh, come up with hopefully two or three sites that will logistically fit throughout the city to meet the needs of the citizens. Okay, are there any other um, comments or concerns from other commissions? Oh, okay. my only comment. My only comment is that we see this uh, every year, and usually, um, uh, the individuals have already exhausted their appeals by the time that these get to us. So, um, yeah. So this is this this has already been a really long road for them. That's all. And I realize that we have this brush clearance thing, which is. Creates, there's 
uh, <clears throat> and that we have breast clearance every year. You're right. That's true. And we do have a number of uh, people who, and they're various companies. Cause some of them are like companies and businesses and different people. And then they're individuals. Um, and uh, so, uh, Okay, is there a motion to approve the item A? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Gomez, which drew the roll call, please. What's Gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. Ibarra? Commissioner Ibarra? Oh, aye. Ninberg? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next item, which is also breast clearance. And uh, we'll go with uh, item B. President Woods Grave, the item B is the appeals for the non compliance fees. After their initial inspection, a second inspection is done. If the owner, property owner, does not clear their abatement or abate their hazard, there's a second fee that's issued. And that's what all these appeals are. They're written in. They're not seen in by hearing officer. They'll file it through a county, and it's just a written appeal that the hearing officers will evaluate. The property owner can send pictures, hardship letters, medical bills, maybe deployment on, on military leave and all that will be assessed by the hearing officer and it will grant or deny their uh, appeal for the second notice fee, which is $516. We had approximately, we had actually 627 completed appeals and out of those 627, 31 were granted. The revenue for these non-compliance fees is $307,536. And do you have difficulty collecting that money? The county will handle all that. Brush clearance does not get involved in with the collecting this. And then it's sent back to the the city treasurer? General fund, yes. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I saw the big stack of uh, papers in the, all of the, uh, of the different properties. And there were, again, many COVID type things in there and uh, people who have difficulty because of COVID. And I know, I, my opinion was that some, I don't know what was done for the COVID people because, you know, we had rent relief, relief for people. We had mortgage relief for people. We had different reliefs for people who have difficulty with COVID. And so um, was there anything done with the COVID uh, reasons, the people who said they had problems with because of COVID? President Woods grade the same as the, uh, the previous one. It was all documented. They can document hardship. The hearing officers would waive the complete fee or not. So it was granted or denied, and that is all based. If we look at some of them, I believe some of them had hardships. A lot of them are really just change of owner. Someone sells their house, moves. That property info is not transferred, and that's when they get these fees. Those are pretty much the ones that were granted, along with hardship that they can provide it. And a lot of them had difficulty with with uh, getting an answer from our department because and um, because they would tr call in, I guess, and no one was answering them or wouldn't they would write in, no one was responding to their questions or whatever. I noticed that on some of those papers that were sent in. So there's an email that's sent out before this brush season starts and throughout the process it has contact info. If it's billing related, it's strictly dealt with accounting. If it's any questions regarding brush or clearance, our brush clearance inspectors will handle the call, the complaint, and hopefully visit and touch base with the property owner. And I know personally there was, I tried that number too, because there were issues with uh, calling in to get answers from that number that's on the form that says call this number. Right. And you don't get an answer there. We have to work on making that better for next year because uh, people do need answers uh, and need some kind of contact. Uh, I mean, if you put a number on there and they can't reach anybody, <laughs> that's uh, very disgusting for and, and upsetting for uh, the citizens of the city. 
And the other issue is that when they send that letter from the whoever sends out the letter with the fee on it, it doesn't identify the property on the on on the paper. It just says you owe this amount of money. We tripled your fee because you didn't pay or are you whatever. And uh, but it says you don't know which property it is because there's no like lot L whatever you know the lot numbers. Anyway, that's some issues that we'll talk about for next year because we need to work on making that better for for the citizens to be able to. Uh, I have copies of them too, if I and I can share them with you later. Okay. <clears throat> of the concerns that I'm talking about, <clears throat> and uh, then I went through the drill of making the phone call because I was told it couldn't get through, so I practiced that myself. But um, there are some issues there that we need to work on, and. Um, I have no other concerns except the ones I've already raised. Is anybody, any other commissioners have comments, concerns? If not, a motion is in order. Wait, really quickly, is that a staffing issue? You know, I personally feel that it is a staffing issue, but um, somehow the people in the department, they think not, well, the people in the brush clearance think they have enough help. I think they don't have enough help. Because not even for the inspections, when I talked about inspections and um, uh, going out to do the lots, and they have thousands of lots to go back and revisit, like 12,000, wasn't it, sir? Total lots is 140,000 annually. No, I mean, they revisited the lots that had to be revisited. Wasn't it something like around 12,000? Yes. And so, but they only had a few people to go back and do all of that. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's a staffing issue. So, um, as I said, we need to work on this for next year and uh, see if we can make it. We'll work with the department and talk to the people in the brush clearance and uh, fire prevention and see what we can do to improve it over the, over the next year. Because I felt that I personally felt after talking with them that it was like, I even asked the question, I think you don't have enough people. <laughs> <laughs> But you know how firefighters are. They never admit they don't have enough people. <laughs> Madam President, if I could comment, we are asking for um, a senior administrative cl uh, clerk because we rely on temp staffing. So in next year's budget, we are asking for a, a permanent authority. Oh, oh okay. well, that would be great. And we assess it every year and we ask each bureau to put in their request and then uh, there's a lot of competing priorities, but uh, we are going to ask again for that uh, senior admin clerk for the brush unit. And I realized that this year was probably a little different because we had the COVID and people were on special assignments and doing other stuff. But I don't think that there are enough people doing the inspection of the lot sheet because uh, they had 12,000 revisits and I think they had three people. Well, we, we do detail people from the field. Captain Bosco, you want to talk about our brush detail? Yeah, President uh, Jamie Wood. So we have a brush task force that we form up, which is compri comprised of about 45 inspectors. They get pulled out from other sections and units, and they do what's called a brush task force, and they hit it hard for several months. It's about two months, mm -hmm. two months straight where they just go and they all they do is brush inspections, inspections throughout the entire city. Once that initial charge of inspections is done, initial violations are written, second violations are written, then we'll dwindle that task force, send the inspectors back. And that's all based on overtime opportunity. So the rest of the city doesn't suffer, the rest of the bureau doesn't suffer, but they're pulled on an overtime idea that they can come and assist the brush task force. Yes, it's after that initial visit is when you cut the number of people down, right? That's correct. And that's when you have to go back and reinspect. Correct. And that's when you have the 12,000 lots. At least this time you did, which is, I think, more than you've had in the past. And um, so, and I think that that was where a shortage was created. I think that was a shortage because that's quite a few lots to revisit throughout the whole city. Uh, and you, as I said, starting in San Pedro and going all the way to the valley and from we have a huge city. Um, anyway, it's something we can talk. We will talk about this more 
as we prepare for next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so think about the things we've talked about and we'll work on it. Um, okay. Is there um, a motion to approve uh, the recommendation and item B? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve uh, item BFC 22-01. Um, Ms. Gomez, would you do a roll Yes. Aye. Woods Cray. Um, Hara. Aye. Ibarra. Aye. Ninberg. Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Now we're at item C. Item C. Uh, thank you. Uh, is that, are you Captain Vasquez? Oh, he went off. Okay. Item C. That's the, uh, the Recruit Training Academy. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Madam President, Chief Oh, Good morning, morning. Chief Skelly. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Good. Thank you. I'd like to present with you our um, our annual report. I'm Steve Skelly, Recruit Services Section. Honored to to present to you our Recruit Academy overview. In this board report, reflects data and analysis from the time recruit firefighters enter the academy, from the end of their probation. The timeline to get a full data set is about 18 months to mature. This report captures data from four academy classes, 19-1 through 21-1. The data parameters used to ensure consistency in presentation and analysis include new hires, those are the, the new recruits that we have in the academy, reassigned refers to the recruits that were placed in subsequent academies, graduates, the amount of recruits that successfully completed the academy, and then those who completed probation refers to the probationary firefighters who have successfully completed their field internship, which is one year. See on the chart on page three is our in status section. This includes all data fields of new hires, reassigns, graduates, and those who completed probation. There are two academy classes, 19-1 and 19-2, that met these parameters. It was found that there was an 87% academy retention rate at graduation, which is a 4% increase from our last report of 83%. Note that 83% has been consistent since class 14-1. We've had 19, excuse me, we've had 99 members graduate, 97 complete the probation, and this is a slight increase in probationary retention of 98%. Our last was 97%. Page four of the 17 female new, uh, new hires, 10 graduated, resulting in a 59% academy retention rate. And uh, note that all 10 have completed their probation. Um, of the of the seven who did not graduate, three were due to performance and basic training. One was due to performance in their manipulative training and phases. Two resigned because it quote not for me, and one resigned to go to another fire agency. Of the 99 graduates who advanced probation, only two fi probationary firefighters did not complete their probation. Note that neither separation was due to performance. One resigned to accept a position with another agency, and one for personal reasons. The chart on page uh, page four, chart 1.2, you see that uh, we've had 20 African American who have completed probation, uh, which is a 70 and a 74 percent retention rate in the academy. 11 Asian firefighters, uh, resulting in 80 uh, percent uh, academy retention. 32 Caucasian firefighters, 97 academy, 97 percent academy retention. Three Filipino firefighters with a 75 percent academy retention. Note there are only three that that were in there for that, you counted in that, that year. Uh, 28 Hispanic firefighters um, completed their probation with a 93% academy retention and uh, two Native American with a probation with a 66% academy retention. Then overall 87% academy retention with uh, 97 who completed probation. Some highlights in this section is that we probationary retention remains high at 98%. Uh, academy retention for the past three reporting periods has averaged 86%. Diversity in our academy classes are a much better reflection of our city of Los Angeles workforce. In our ongoing status section, pages five and six, measured the two academy classes, which includes two of the three data fields, which is new hires and graduates. 
This population of recruits have graduated from the academy and are still progressing through their probationary period. Class 20-1 will complete their probation in May and 21-1 in November. We have 85 members in this category. A few highlights include that diversity in the academy remains relatively consistent from new hire through graduation. Diversity in our academy classes are a better reflection of the city of Los Angeles workforce. Female representation equals 6% of our probationary members. The academy retention rate is 86%. The bottom of page six begins the current academy section, which includes one academy class, which is 21-2. Uh, they're in their 15 week of instruction, preparing for their probationary assignments, followed their, following by their, their February 10th graduation. Um, 21 2 is a small, diverse class that we're able to add to offset last year's budgetary constraints. 21 2 began in October with 49 new hires, eight reassigned from previous classes. We we're in our last two weeks of training, and we anticipate sending 36 new members to the field on February 13th. Although not included in this annual report, it's worth noting that we've started class 21 3. This diverse class of 74 is in their third week of training, and we look forward to their graduation in April. The pipeline model of training has started, and we anticipate graduating five classes per year. The uh, recruit reassign program, during this reporting period, the reassignment program has graduated 23 of uh, 20, 23 people or 29 who entered the program. No, there's a typo on page seven that states that we graduated 56. That is incorrect. It's 23. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, this results in a 79% of, um, of a reassignment program for this reporting period. Recruits can be reassigned in subsequent cl uh, classes due to illness or injury, performance and fundamental skills, which is hose and ladders, or in practical application. And there could be other unforeseen circumstances. Of the six um, reassigns that did not graduate, one took a position with another agency, one did not return from injury, two did not return from injury, um, and uh, three were um, due to their performance. In an effort to continue to be proactive and increase re uh, recruit retention rates, the Recruit Services section has made enhancements to our training program. August of 2021, the department asked Recruit Services to explore ways to maximize the amount of recruit firefighters that can be trained and graduate each fiscal year. The section developed a pipeline system which will increase recruit output to the field nearly double, however, only increase our staffing by 30 percent. This will be accomplished by maximizing the yard space of the recruits three facilities here at Frank Hodgkins Memorial Training Center, the Valley Recruit Training Academy, and the Harbor Recruit Training Academy as facilities. It's anticipated the department will be able to graduate over 240 recruits each year. And note that due to extreme staffing shortages and the possibility of significant increase in vacancies, Recruit Service has been working on ways to deliver the training curriculum at an accelerated pace without compromising firefighter public safety. And we are talking about a 14-week training academy. The CAN Assistance Program, which is CAPS, continues to be a valuable tool providing regular opportunities for our candidates to gain exposure to LAFD cultures and the rigors of the fire service. We're conducting three CAPS sessions per week, and we now train on a firefighting skill and piece of equipment at every session. Before, this is only at one session per week. Furthermore, we developed workouts for candidates to use on their days off or for those who are out-of-town candidates. We keep our candidates on a structured workout plan to gain strength for the academy. Our injury prevention unit, Sean Higgs, has developed a strength program to increase each candidate's physical fitness. Our CAPS coordinator has been developing systems to use metrics to, uh, to track valuable data to better prepare our candidates. In the injury prevention unit, in an effort to retain recruit firefighters, recruit services, and their injury prevention unit coordinate, continue to cooperate on injury prevention. The IPU is available for, to recruit firefighters on their days off to gain professional assistance to prevent injury enhanced nutrition, receive personal strength, and flexibility and exercise program. Uh, it must be said that COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on the training academy. During this reporting period, recruit services have had to remain very flexible with our, and our staff with, uh, in altering graduation dates to comply with ever-changing COVID protocols. Academy staff and recruits have been very cautious with social distancing, and continuing with temperature checks, surface decon, uh, and offering remote, remote learning for, um, for any recruits that may need to isolate. Our current class, 21-2, had to take a tactical pause for two weeks um, due to the spread of uh, the Omicron virus. Um, today, we've not, uh, to date, we have not lost a single recruit due to COVID-19. And 21-2 and all future classes will be vaccinated prior to the start of the academy. This will be handled through Medical Services Division. Mm -hmm. 
Probationary Firefighter Mentorship Program was proposed two years ago. It was a program coordinated by the Equality Assurance Unit. The feedback shows that it continues to be valuable, significant value to the graduating recruits as they transition to their field assignments. This program has a minimal financial footprint and has been permanently adopted by the Quality Assurance Unit. Continue to annual staff um, calibration as it's an in, 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 integral part of our staff's continued training. We do invite speakers from our chain of command, from the Fire Chief Operations Training and Support Bureau Training Division, uh, myself, risk management, behavioral health, and stakeholders. In this training, we reinforce the entire staff, department expectations, visions, the mission, the mission, our goals, our core values, and to uh, be sure that there's no question of the importance of maintaining our work environment conducive for learning, free from harassment, discrimination, or retaliation. And finally, I often visit Drill Towers 40 and 81. I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge that our staff is hardworking. Um, these instructors and staff are doing excellent work, and we're proud of what they're handling of recruit firefighters. This concludes my report, and I'd like to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Chief Skelly, for a very thorough uh, report. Um, <clears throat> when they're vaccinated, <laughs> uh, they, do we give them the first and second vaccination? Um, we were doing that in the previous academies when when uh, COVID was was becoming the vaccines vaccines became available. Now they need to prove their vaccination status through medical services division as part of their pre employment checks. Oh, if they I don't see. have them. They, they they will be offered through medical services. Oh, okay, very good. That's that's great. Um, now in the uh, the the. Um, the academy recycles, are they included in the graduation rates? Yes. At which point and which graduation rates? Uh, they'll be, the graduation rate will go to the class, it will be counted in the class that they graduate with. There'll be a new, oh. there'll be a new hire, there'll be a new hire with the class that they begin with. And then normally it's the next class. If there's, if there's uh, what we call reassigned members. Uh, they'll be counted into the graduation rates of that next class. However, we have um, we have a breakdown of of everybody who entered that class. And they're counted in, in the uh, total graduation for the class that they graduate with. Yes. Okay, but you said they're a new hire with the class they started with. Become a new hire in the class they start with, and their graduation is counted with the class they graduate with. I see. Okay. Very good. Uh, commissioners, are there comments or concern questions? Uh, Commissioner Ember, I see your hand is up. Very good. <laughs> can't, are you on mute? You're on mute. You can't unmute? Oh, wow. <laughs> You're good now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, uh, it probably is because I was, I wasn't made a, I, my computer died. So when I jumped back on, I wasn't a co-host. Um, so my fault. Um, so thank you, Chief Skelly. I appreciate this. Um, and to Commissioner Woods Gray's point. So on um, item 1.1, you have 17 new female hires and 10 graduates, but how many from that class were reassigned? This, this report, this report shows um, those two classes combined. Uh, I would have to pull the data from each class to see who ended, in, ended up in the reassignment section. Uh, so class 19, one. So from class 19, one, I had one. Two. I had three. I had three female that were reassigned in 19, one into class 19, two, of which, of which three graduated, and. Uh, one resigned to go to a different agency. Wait, okay. You had three in between mm -hmm. nineteen one and nineteen two. One. No, just nineteen one. Okay, and so 
So can you just clarify? Three, three, gra three graduated in 192, and then one resigned out of class 20-1. So three graduated, one resigned, four from class 191. Okay, so 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 this so I'm concerned because this only shows the graduation. So you have 17 new hires and the academy retention. What's the academy retention for new hires of women and men? Um I don't I don't think I I don't think I have that. I don't think I have that statistic in front of me. I could I could break that down, but our focus our focus is graduating capable uh, firefighters that can get through there, and we're gonna do everything it takes to get them through, whether it's one or two attempts. For sure. I just I, I just think it's really important to know, um, so it's clear, right? If how many you know, of which gender or race are reassigned, how many, um, I just, because it's, I understand what you're saying, um, and it takes a while, but the problem is, is that you have, uh, it was less than 55% retention rate of the people that we're recruiting are staying from 2014. So we've lost 55 women since 2014, which if you look at, we have 117 total, that's almost 50%. Um, and if we really, and I appreciate you working on trying to solve these problems. And I, and I saw African-Americans here um, went from 74 to hundred percent, which is great. Um, Although I have to make sure we just have to we just have to make sure that the reassigns are clear because you have academy retention. So in class 20.1, 20 point one, 20 point to 21 point one, 14 new hires and 14 graduates, academy retention is 100 percent. But were any of those reassigns? So those. Those are the questions we need to get answered so that we can make this as clear and as like we can find out what the issues are. Right. And so um, and if there's a disparate outcome, you know, I mean, look, you also had Caucasians that had gone down to 81 percent mm -hmm. and Latinos, got, you know, 84 percent. So. But one thing that has been consistent is that females are washing out, failing, leaving, whatnot, um, at significantly higher rates. I mean, we sh that's a, that is, I think one of the people uh, who called in said, you know, that's really expensive. They mentioned the expense of this. Um, and it's... I think it's 125,000 to put somebody through something like that. Mm -hmm. that right? depends, on how many, depends on how many we're hiring that year, but it's about, about $92,000. Okay. So if you've lost 55 women, you know, that's millions and millions of dollars. Um, not going to do the math right now, but uh, I, um, okay. So I'd like to, so I have a couple other questions. I would like this to come back. Maybe, uh, just to give you, because I know the next report's due on, so maybe March, the first week of March, you know, our first meeting in March, we can get this um, with the reassigns added to these um, charts. I'd like to just have it broken out so we know exactly, like, how many new hires, how many reassigns. I have that data in front of me. I can provide that. Okay, great. Oh, then you can, can you bring that to the next meeting then? As requested. Excellent. Thank you. I also want to ask, um, so this class, these classes, hold on a second. What was cut to 
from 22 weeks to 14 weeks, what specifically was cut? That's an, that's an excellent question. Uh, so, so in basically analyzing our, our syllabus, um, I want to tell you that nothing was cut, but we moved training, we moved training around. Okay. So mm -hmm. things that were handled in the academy um, were, are now, some may be pushed into the probationary period. Um, some things have been maintained and we've become more efficient in, uh, remember our state firefighting training? Uh, mm -hmm. A few years ago, that was a big deal and it added a lot of hours to the academy. Yep. We've, we figured out a way to be um, to be more efficient with that, and now we are using our training that is, uh, which is going to capture the state training, and we basically saved basically two weeks from that. We made one adjustment to one of our um, basic hose lays and created a brush hose lay instead of one of our one of our others, and we did a substitution, and uh, now a lot of our brush hours are being captured during our basic our basic academy. Other areas that we did is we saved saved two weeks. We used to do our uh, Ipsley program, which was our leadership our leadership mini leadership academy. That was a 40 hour course. Um, that now we take some of the um, the highlights of that course and pepper it through the academy, and save those 40 hours. And now also we just use their EMT that they um, are all required to be EMTs. So now what we're doing is we're using Target Solutions to catch them up to make sure they're all on the same page. And we're going to handle any research of their EMTs right prior to graduation. So they'll all be on at least the same schedule, saving an additional 40 hours. Some of the things that we uh, had to back, back off on was our 24 hour ride alongs. We used to send them 24 hour ride along on each shift, the A platoon, the B platoon and the C platoon, which basically took us a week of our instruction and so we don't do that anymore. Um, and then also the uh, you remember the big uh, the big demonstration, the exciting demonstration we did at graduation, that took a week to prepare for. So we're not doing that anymore. So that's how we that's how we accomplished going into our uh, 14 week academy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, um, I think a lot of that makes sense. I think that um, for sure that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm concerned, though, about, especially with workplace culture issues, that the assessment that came out was, um, showed significant cultural issues. And I'm concerned that the, that pushing these leadership courses to the field isn't going to be consistent. No, no, and that, that wasn't a, the leadership course. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing a 40-hour a 40 right up front course, we, uh, I like to say we pepper the lectures throughout the academy. So the leadership, core values, mission, vision, um, all the things that was handled in the Ipsley course is now we pepper it throughout the academy, during the academy, not just all right up front. That leadership is not – the leadership course is not pushed to the field. Okay, so all 40 hours get – our, I would be lying to say that they get all 40 hours, but they get they get um, um, they get the hours peppered through, and our instructors are the Ipsley instructors also. So they take their they take their best material and they they pepper it into the into the academy. Yeah, I'm. Uh, okay, I'm I'm concerned about that just because of the assessment that was done. Um, and are, did you, what about mental health? Uh, mental health, they still, they still come, um, at orientation and they have their, they have their times during the academy that hasn't changed. So this, it's the same, I think it's eight, eight hours, eight hours through the course of their, of their training and probation. Of their training, what? Of their, tra of their initial training and through their probation. Okay, so it's so the eight hours is cut from the academy and put into a year. It's it's the same. We, it's it's as requested by the commission two years ago. You wanted you wanted eight hours over over the one year, and we okay. we left that the same. Okay, all right. I would um, 
I think that we that we definitely need to make that a priority. Um, I also want to ask. Um, so you have what percent of the academy is focused on the fire ground and what percent is focused on medical? Um, I would say 90% 90, 90 is fire ground. 90% fire ground and 10% medical. And what, what is the, so when your calls, what percent of your calls are fire ground and what percent or require fire response and what percent require medical? Roughly 85% of our calls are for medical services. Okay. So 85%. So it seems I, it's like the reverse, right? That's because that there's reasons for that. We do, they're trained up front in EMT prior to coming in here and we get to, we get to get them up to speed. <clears throat> Firefighting is very dangerous. We're, we ask, we ask people with basically no experience and then in, in 14 weeks expecting them to go into burning buildings. That, that, that is the focus of the academy is to make sure that we send probationary firefighters that are safe and effective entry level. They're not going to get themselves or somebody else killed on their first day. That's why we focus so much on firefighting. So that's also of concern, right? Is what are we, you know, people always say we want to make sure our standards are the highest. Um, absolutely, we should be doing that for the fire ground. But I also think we really need to start focusing on our medical response and making sure that, you know, we're an all, all emergency response. Yes, ma'am. You know, we're doing swift water rescue. We're doing all kinds of, you know, like, <laughs> you know, uh, USAR, everything. Now, I, I am not disagreeing with you at all. Uh, I've been a paramedic. I've been a paramedic for for most of my career, mm -hmm. and uh, we we do EMS 85% uh, of the times. EMS does not get us killed. Fire ground, fire grounds. That's why the focus in the academy is fire ground. So right. I'm not I'm not discounting EMS. And and but. EMS doesn't get EMS is for the for the citizen, right? It's not you. I mean, we want to protect our citizens, right? So I, I just want to us to consider, you know, yes, absolutely, you know. And then, you know, there was that tragedy up in Stockton. A firefighter just got killed in by gunfire. Um, I think that yes, being out in the field is dangerous. Period. And and I understand that I have not run into a burning building. I get that. Um, however, I do think that if even culturally, that if we put that much of an emphasis on fire and that are we valuing our medical response? Are we training our people to, you know, yeah, of course it's not going to kill you, but the better trained our members are in medical response or even supporting, you know, let's say they're not paramedics, but they're EMTs. Do you have any comments on the cutting of the EMS training? Uh, not really. Wait, what's that? Okay. All right. Jimmy? All right. Madam President, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> that was... <laughs> I, I, um, my, my comment is that I, this, we're doing this temporarily. And when things catch up, we're going to go back to the old schedule. Is that right, Chief Skelly? Uh, that's going to, that's going to be up to the current administration, but yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I uh, just, I because President, the components yeah. that you had to sprinkle in between and everywhere, they are important, but, and I understand because EMS, EM, T's that are already trained, and so you would go a little bit less on that because of an emergency situation that we're in, uh, and of course, brushing all that training of the fire mm -hmm. grounds is a whole totally new thing for them. 
So I, I understand that, but I'm thinking, I'm just wondering if there will be a time. Chief Tarazas, I see you have, I think, comments on this. Yeah, you know, thank you, Madam President. I think Chief Skelly is, is spot on. Um, let's understand that paramedics, to become a paramedic, requires months of training and gets, uh, has to be renewed every two years. Same thing for EMTs, not as long as a paramedic training program, but it's extensive and takes several weeks and it has to be recertified every two years. I just completed mine. Oh. But what kills us on the fire ground are fires, not EMS. So we have to be very diligent to make sure our people are safe. If they're not safe, they become a liability for other firefighters and the public. So that is a important uh, criteria. Uh, I'm not dismissing EMS um, by no means. It, it is 85% approximately of our runs, but we do not get killed on EMS incidents. We get killed at fires. So we have to balance uh, the training and the training that is focused on EMS comes primarily before they get to the drill tower. So once again, um, I, I, that narrative is, and, and I've heard that for sure, but we've got to make sure that like, you're not getting killed, but we're going, we're trying to save our citizens from getting killed, right? Or dying. And so that's really what EMS is doing is making sure they're healthy. So I understand, I'm just, I'm just trying to expand our reasonings and expand the way we look at our training and what we're valuing. And I think that, <laughs> of course, I would never compromise fire ground safety. Absolutely not. Um, and, and understanding when to be defensive and offensive, like it's, those are seconds that you have to train, train, train. And I'm not, it's never a question whether or not people are highly trained in fire on the fire ground here. Um, I do believe that our department, unlike many other departments, trains all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's all they do is train, which is, which has made them excellent certainly in the fire ground. I am saying that when we are going into the academy, you know, what specifically are we valuing? And is that hammered home that we need to make sure that our EMS is of equal import and that we are making sure that people understand that yes, we, we need our firefighter safety, but we also need the safety of our public as well. And that's what we're doing. These are the calls we're responding to. So that's my concern. And I don't want to compromise on medical just because we need to shorten the term, you know, the academy. I just, we just need to make sure. And uh, I do believe Chief Gutierrez has his hand up. So. He's that training. Chief Gutierrez has his hand up. Okay, Chief Gutierrez. Uh, just, Chief, just before you say that, I because the EMS come to us already trained, we don't really have to train them as much, right? Correct. Um, so therefore, they're kind of like ready to go, but they don't know fire ground imps. Correct. And that's what they need. They really correct. need. Okay, Chief Gutierrez. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning. How Ms. are you? Uh, good. Just, I didn't see your hand there. Yeah. Just a few things. Uh, I think in understanding uh, a training academy in its totality, uh, we're mandated as an accredited academy to have a specific curriculum that includes a lot of the you know fire ground issues and fire ground things, not only mandated by the state, but also OSHA. So there is, if you look at specifically like in, in changes that we've made in the number of hours, you know, we're, uh, we're well, uh, historically well within the hours we have been. We're at roughly 600 hours of training that we've been uh, historically, if you look at past decade, that's where we've been. Now it's expanded over the years. Like Chief Skelly mentioned the state, some of the state training and being state ALA certified and things, some of those, some of those things. 
But um, EMS is a great part of it. All firefighters come in entry level uh, uh, certified as, as EMTs. We actually put them through scenario-based scenarios to utilize that EMT throughout the academy. So as you mentioned earlier, uh, Commissioner Nimberg, we are all risk. And that all risk component is, and, and, and you have to understand too, I think what, what's missing here is that every fire related scenario or fire ground related emergency, there is an EMS component. So in other words, at a working structure fire, there's an EMS component, that rescue piece. At a traffic or, or a physical rescue, there's that EMS component. As we get into you know, uh, trench rescue, all these different things, which are really what we consider uh, very um, uh, low frequency, yet very, very, very high risk. Mm -hmm. So these are the things, and I don't know if his percentages was quite right in terms of how we blend the different training. We'd have to look at that very closely to give an accurate percentage. But EMS is embedded in everything we do. I think it's really important to understand that, that for all of us, you know, I came out as EMT over 35 years ago, and we're all, e we're all EMTs. So um, I think in, in order to give an accurate answer in terms of what that curriculum really looks like and that percentages, we'd have to go back and actually uh, provide that, you know, so that we know specifically what, what we're doing and what it looks like. Um, and I think overarching what I want to say is, you know, the EMS is embedded in everything we do. Uh, you know, from, from the time we onboard in, employees to the training academy to the time they graduate. And I think the other thing that was brought up was some of the things in terms of leadership piece. And I think Chief Scally mentioned some of the Ipsley piece and how it was now going through, ongoing through the academy. I think that's very important because in looking at it, and I've been here for just about a year and looking at the academy um, and, and putting 40 hours uh, week one into the academy and having uh, and employees coming in that are new and they come from very diverse backgrounds many of which haven't never worked in a fire service or even fire service related uh, organization and try and understand first they have to really understand our policies and our procedures so they can make good ethical decisions and, and kind of embed them and they do a really good job if you look at the assessment that took place one of the highlights in that was in fact the mentoring and quality assurance piece and that's ongoing through the probationary period so that piece is is really well and so the, the changes that were made uh, in, in terms of looking at everything very critically through a very narrow scope of what we're doing was first and foremost was to ensure that we put safe and effective entry-level firefighters. I specifically went back and looked and evaluated the training for over a decade and looked specifically what we were taking out, ensuring that we didn't take out those things that were necessary to ensure our firefighters are safe. And, and, I, and I think if you can kind of think of it this way in a sense is that um, you're on an airplane and they say, hey, the oxygen mask drops. You put it on yourself, then you put it on the person next to you. The firefighters need to understand how to be safe and operate safely so they can actually ensure the public safety. So, and that's what's everything because everything that we do has an EMS component to it. Every emergency, quite often, there's many none that, that don't. So, uh, I hope I just bring a better context to it. Um, I think the actual percentages needs to be evaluated uh, in terms of what that looks like. But again, we're mandated by a lot of these things. Uh, we're OSHA mandated, we're accredited mandated. And again, if you, if we, all of us think about um, how these employees come in, where many of them came from, you know, just let's say customer service jobs, and now they need to understand how to wear PPEs, how to put an SCB on, how to work and operate tools and equipment. They are EMTs. They all come in as certified EMTs. Now what we do is blend those EMT skills with our operations, our protocols, our county mandates, and all of that throughout, uh, throughout the academy. Okay, very good. I see uh, Commissioner Ibarra has hands. Commissioner Ibarra, yes. you have I, I was actually going to make uh, some of the, uh, I mean, not as well, but some of the same points that uh, Chief Gutierrez was making. And uh, from the perspective of the public, uh, some of the high risk um, events that they look to the fire department for are fire emergencies, especially. And during wildfire season, uh, which is year round now, um, that's like the most important thing that we do. Of course, that EMS has become a more important component oh, or I'm not going to say EMS, but medical calls are a more important component. But when we look at calls that should not have should not be um, should not be handled by the fire department, they tend to be categorized at EMS, but they're so low level 
uh, that they're miscategorized. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, I think there's just a lot of issues with how we categorize our, um, our calls. Um, I, I mean, I, I think 80, I think it's closer to what uh, Chief Gutierrez was saying is that everything that we do has an EMS component because there's always, you know, the reason that we do what we do is because uh, lives are most important. So there's always going to be a component of like we're trying to save lives, whether it's a fire, whether it's a rescue. Um, but the abilities that people look to the fire department for are specialized training that they don't have, which is not driving somebody to the hospital, but like knowing how to fight a fire, knowing, knowing how to fight a brush fire, knowing how to execute a rescue properly uh, to save lives. That's the specialized training that they have in the fire department that the rest of the civilians don't have. And they need, I mean, they like their fire department for the most part because you know, we have a high level of skill and training. So I, you know, I, so I would be really wary about like going in a direction where we're going to compromise that because that's really like what has made this department the best in the world is that we do all risks. You know, we just experienced an earthquake. If it's, if it's an earthquake, this department knows how to handle that and knows how to do uh, rescues from in that kind of situation. If it's anything, uh, any kind of risk, if it's a tsunami, this department knows how to execute rescues. That's why this department is the best in the world. Um, so I think that for us and for, for this commission, that's the most important thing that, you know, we need to keep focused on, knowing that medical calls are going to continue to be, uh, are going to continue to come into this department. Um, they may or they may not need to be um, handled by this department. There's a lot of calls that we get about homelessness and about people experiencing um, severe mental distress. Those are medical calls and those should probably be handled by somebody else. So we, there's, this is an interesting time because we're gonna sort of reimagine how, uh, what is the core functions of this department and what can be done by others. Um, but certainly like we're not, we're medical, we do EMS and we do paramedical services, but let's not pretend that we, you know, we're going to be treating people and doing surgeries in the field. That's not what people think that we do. That's not what people look for us to do. Um, sorry, I just, I needed to make that point. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Are there other comments or concerns? Uh, is your hand up? Uh, Commissioner Barr, and I mean, uh, member. Yes. Yes. Okay. I see your hand. Yeah. I, um, so as, as the oversight body, um, I think it would be negligent if we didn't ask these questions, right? This is civilian oversight and we need to make sure that we are, um, protecting our civilians and let's under no circumstance, did I ever say that we should compromise our fire safety and our fire ground? But if we could, have we looked at expanding our medical and un expanding what it means to respond? So I think that we need to make sure about like, and I think this is, I think to Delia Barra's point, this is a great time that to reimagine what we do here. And take it all in. And instead of, you know, using the term, you know, 100 years unimpeded by progress, mm -hmm. that we take this opportunity to reimagine what it is we're doing, what it is we're valuing. You know, of course, you know, we need to make sure our firefighters and paramedics are safe. That is critical, number one. However, we also need to make sure that we are providing, you know, the best service to everyone. And let's, let's take this opportunity to reimagine what it is we do. You know, less than 3% less than of our calls are fires. And less than, I think it's about 1% are actual fires. You know, and thank God for the Fire Prevention Bureau. They've done such an incredible job. Thanks to brush clearance. Thanks to, you know, 
all of these different departments, you know, urban wildfire, like firefighting is fundamentally different than it was 30 years ago, you know, and let's like figure out exactly, this is such a great opportunity. I'm really excited about this time too. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is the physical assessments of that are done. So you have the accreditation. I get that this, you know, the state the credits, whatnot. Um, I want to know, you know, a lot of these, certainly the women, um, are failing out in the physical parts, right? And so we should look at getting a third party assessment of what is actually required, <clears throat> what is done on this job. Because if it's done internally, we're just gonna replicate, keep replicating what we know. That's what that's what humans do. They, you know, it's very difficult to innovate from the inside. Uh, you can, but you know, our numbers aren't moving. Certainly not for women. They're just not moving. They're like abysmal. Mm -hmm. And it's costing us a lot of money. It's costing us, we're losing women, you know, to other agencies. And it's, it's unfortunate because you're, you're missing out on 50% of the population. So, you know, and that point of view of 50% of the population. I don't ever think that we'll get to 50%. That's not what I'm saying. But if you lose 50%, the point of view of 50% of the population, that's problematic. Are you, then are you giving the best service you possibly can? So this is another great opportunity to look and see um, do, about doing a third party assessment of our academy and our physical requirements, you know? And if, you know, like if we're making sure, you just wanna make sure that we're not failing out people unnecessarily because of tradition, because this is the way things have always been done. And yes, I know that you, you're innovating and you're, and I appreciate this. I really do appreciate the innovations, but the numbers aren't moving. So what specifically are the issues? Because let's, let's get this done. So I'd like to see um, a report back on, a third party assessment of the academy and what that would look like, much like, and I think uh, uh, the vice chair of the Stentorians who called um, Captain Hawkins also mentioned that as well, you know, getting surveys done and figuring out, you know, we have access to surveys and surveying our members. And yes, in the third party assessment of Deloitte, it said the academy was great. You know, that the Experience Academy members were great, but at, when they got in the field, it was very different. So I would love to get a report back on that as well. So. Very good. Thank you. Are there other comments? Any other further comments for Chief Skelly, Chief Gutierrez, or for Chief Terrazas? Okay. I okay. think I I think we've exhausted that. Wait, Wait one more. Uh, yeah, well, just the okay. date. And the report back. Oh, the report back date. Uh yeah. Uh, what date were you asking for? Yeah, the report back on the third party assessment of the training academy. I mean, when did you did you put a date with me? Yeah, I is uh, thirty days, sixty days enough? Let's do sixty days. Let's do sixty days. Well, you think, Chief Skelly, I see your head kind of going. <laughs> yes, a report back. Not that you're going to do it, just like, what's the research, you know? I know that there are companies out there. What's the cost of it? Um, what well, are you going to look at? You brought this up. You brought this up in our last meeting. Uh-huh. So you wanted a practical application validation to validate the validation that we did, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. We're... The process, there actually isn't a company that's out there that can actually do this unless it's fire service related because it's so specific. So we can't just put out an RFP um, to get that data. So we're working on uh, something called an RFI, which is request for information. And hopefully there's someone out there that can give us, give us uh, something that will turn us into, that will turn into an RFP. Um, we're hoping that we could have something 
uh, started by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so we've been actually working on this. Uh, it's just a very difficult process because there isn't somebody out there, somebody out there to do that. But what, what I think is really, this is what I love about this department is like, we have the opportunity to be a leader here. You know, this is reimagining what we do. And so I appreciate the work. If you could just, maybe if you could just write something up, give 60 days and give us a progress report on that. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you. On, on that hey, point, uh, Commissioner Ibar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to chime in. Um, I just, I think it's really important for us to sort of, um, for the public also, and for the, and for some of the commissioners to sort of understand how too generous this department is as compared to other departments. I know that sometimes when we talk about sort of reimagining the department, people talk about like, you know, what some fire chief in New York thinks we should be doing. And I'm not really sure that that's really helpful for us because we're so different. We're such a different model from other big city fire departments because they don't have like the wildland um, urban interface. Um, you know, so whereas New York is going to have the large industrial fires that we do and Chicago does that as well. You know, very few people have like the industrial core and the urban, you know, wildland thing that we have to do and that we do every year. Um, and, and the mutual aid that we give to all of the suburban fire departments in this region. Um, so it's really, you know, is there anybody else exactly like LA City? Maybe LA County. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's nobody who's who does everything that we do uh, at the level that we do it. So when you do this, I just hope that you would think a lot about that, about, you know, is there another model for us? Um, and, and maybe there isn't. And who's going to have that experience to sort of, you know, give us feedback on us? I, I don't think we should be looking at New York. I don't think we should be looking at Chicago. So who are we looking at? Um, that's a conversation for you to have because you are the subject matter experts. So I'm just sort of throwing it out there for, um, for you, Chief Skelly, and um, for Chief Crawley, for Chief Terrazas. Um, you know what you're doing, um, but it's a conversation that we should all have together. But I want you guys to do that homework. Thanks. Okay, very good. Um, is there a motion to um, receive and file uh, item C, BFC 2101? So moved. Uh, 02, I'm sorry. 012. So moved. Is there a second? second? That's been moved and second that we uh, receive and file uh, BFC 22-012. Ms. Gomez, if you do the roll call, please. What's gray? Hi. Hara. Aye. Ibarra. Aye. Ninberg. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Chief Skelly. That would that created a robust discussion, which I think was, was interesting and important. And I'm glad that we're able to have uh, these discussions with you and Chief Gutierrez and Chief Tarazas and soon Chief Crowley. Uh, thank you very much for that, for all the work that you do there. Uh, mm -hmm. and continue on with uh, what you're doing. But I'm, I'm thinking that eventually you're going to go back to the old schedule. So, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> what? Much for me out. <laughs> so you're going to cut you, it. Madam 14 President. weeks is going to be it, huh? Okay. Let's go to item D. Item D, BFC 22-013. Is uh, the report on paramedic vacancies. Good morning, Madam President, Commissioners. Good morning, uh, Chief. Um, uh, this is uh, Deputy Chief uh, Graham Everett. I serve as the Chief of Staff. So this is the monthly paramedic vacancy projections. This is based on December 21st numbers of 2021. As you can see from the report, uh, our numbers are fairly stable in the high 20s of vacancies down to the low 30s. Um, uh, obviously nowhere close to the numbers we got to a few years back when we had uh, a lot more vacancies in the paramedic ranks. 
We do projections based on the drop uh, uh, anticipation of exiting drop and retirements, promotions, and also we, we do projections based on the number of recruits that we bring into the drill tower that already have a paramedic license. Um, and also the number of students that we send to paramedic classes over the years. So as you can see, the numbers bounce around a little bit. Um, we are projecting in May of 23, we will have zero paramedic vacancies um, with all, with, with, again, this is projection, so things can change, but the numbers are relatively solid right now um, and, and much lower than we've experienced in the past. Um, paramedic um, training is at a premium right now. Uh, people in the uh, fire service and in the community it's very difficult to find somebody with a paramedic license right now. So, so our numbers are holding solid and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about these numbers. Did we have a recent class to graduate? So the, the numbers on, where you see the, on the chart where it says UCLA, um, that number is a projection of graduates that we will have from the, from our paramedic uh, training program that we use with, uh, UCLA's um, uh, paramedic school. So in January of this of this this past month, we just February first today, we graduated four people from the um, from the school. In May, we anticipate we're going to be graduating eleven, and then moving into September, we look to graduate around fourteen. And again, those are estimates. Um, we have increased the number of seats that we are permitted per year. We've try to get as many seats as we can. But again, we're in competition with other agencies that are trying to do the same thing. Mm. Very good. Are there questions for the chief? Concerns, comments? Um, uh, Commissioner Ibar, uh, Commissioner Nimber. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Chief Everett. Um, this, so what, what are these numbers? You, you told us what the numbers are based on is the number of recruits and how you calculate it. But what is the total number of paramedics? And has that increased since, I mean, how has it increased in the last 10 years? So you kind of have to look at the numbers. Um, you know, like Chief Skelly mentioned, he and I went to paramedic school, you know, 30 years ago. Um, so we are still counted as paramedics on the department because we maintain an active license. Um, however, we haven't seen the work and end of a rescue for many years. Uh, so the ones that are in the field serving as paramedics is a different number than the total number of paramedics. Um, in, I can tell you from experience in 2001, right? Yeah, 2000, 2001, we had around 700 paramedics in the department total. And I know that number is over 1,000 now, um, but again, not every single one of those paramedics is actually working uh, in a paramedic assignment. I can pull those paramedic assignment for you, and these numbers are based on the number of paramedics that we have on the department. So what I'm wondering is, um, like, our population has skyrocketed, right? You know, in the last 20 years, you know, our our paramedics, we work them hard. I mean, I was talking to a firefighter, and they said that, you know, they never see their paramedics at their station. They're always out. Um, so we're, we have standards to cover the report coming back. Um, I'd like to see how, A, if that impacts the number, the actual number of paramedics in the field, because I, I'm concerned, my concern is that, and obviously, you know, we want to, we don't want to burn our firefighter safety paramedic safety. We want to make sure that we're, we're protecting them, that they're not working 24 hour shifts and, you know, like, you know, back to back and at nines or, you know, 64s or whatever, that we're making sure that 
um, we're giving our paramedics a good quality of life and not burning them out so quickly. So I would love to see how we're ex how we've expanded that our paramedics and what that looks like um, and what that has looked like over time, because I think these numbers are based on, I mean, have they changed that much in the last 10 years? Uh, yeah, but, I don't have them in front of me, but I'm, I'm confident they've changed quite a bit as we've increased. So when you look at the number of paramedics, um, you also have to look at the assignments we have for them, right? So we have authorized positions that come with paramedic bonuses and, and that comes with expansion of field resources. So we're not going to get approved in our budget for authorized paramedic positions if those, you know what I mean? If, if we're going to expand, we have to expand those resources that, that require a, a firefighter paramedic to serve on them, right? So as we get the standards of cover back, like you mentioned, we'll probably get some good intel as to where we can um, uh, ask for these authorities to be restored. Uh, within the budget. And then in addition to that, uh, with Chief Tarazis and working with Dr. Eckstein, the EMS Bureau, utilizing other forms of, of, of response capability, the FRVs, the APRU, yeah. these types of things Absolutely. are also alternatives to use firefighter paramedics. And so that also gives us some, some um, uh, justification for the additional authorities needed. I think the standards of cover will populate a lot of those answers as soon as we get it back. That's what I'm actually, I think that that's, and I do, right, like I love the idea of expanding our FRBs, you know, uh, that's fantastic. Expanding, you know, our ambulances, making sure that uh, we are not, certainly we've, it's a heavy burden, you know, looking at the number of calls that we get, you know, that we, those are, are paramedic calls. So we just want to make sure that uh, we give them the support they need. So uh, I'm looking forward. I think the report comes next next meeting. Coming soon. Yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank Madam you. President, may I uh, make a few comments? Sure. Chief Tarazas. I, I share Commissioner Nimbert's concern about our, our paramedics. Uh, we have increased our assessment companies um, in, in the last six years. Every time we brought back a closed engine, we made an assessment. The goal, I think we have less than 20 now stations that are not assessment. The goal should be to get to the point where all stations have a rotational capability so they can, a paramedic can be the paramedic on the engine or truck as well as on the ambulance. So that gives them a break. You know, I'm concerned about burnout as well. The uh, standards of cover report should be coming in the next, I'm told a draft should be here in about a month. Uh, I've already had discussions with the author of it, and I've asked that person to look at the entire city, including uh, the EMS question. Um, so, and I asked him to also look at the specialized resources that Chief Everett uh, talked about, because I, I think those need to be scaled. You know, the FRV, the sober unit, the advanced provider response unit, uh, telemedicine on top of it as well as the therapeutic mental health ban that just got launched a few days ago. All of these things are a means to better distribute the call load, and we should have the more, more appropriate people who are trained in those areas handle those types of calls. All of this together, I think, gets us to the point where we have the ideal model. We're not there yet, but we've made a lot of progress. I appreciate that, Chief. I, I do think that, um, and just hearing, like, we're all on the same page on this is, is great, you know, make that, then we can actually move forward and really provide the best services possible to our residents. So I think this is, and protect our paramedics, you know, it's, we've got to make sure, I just feel so horrible sometimes hearing about their days, you know, and the multiple calls that they go on and um, the lack of sleep and how bad that is for your heart and how bad that is for your body. Um, you know, so, and that we, I definitely am looking forward to helping, you know, learning about how to alleviate that stress and spread, spread out our resources and expand our resources. So I'm excited that, uh, and who's doing the standards of cover? It's CityGate Consultant. Excellent.
Very good. Um, I think the paramedic issue has been an ongoing discussion for the last eight years, right, Chief? And yeah, <laughs> it, it goes, it gets better, and it gets then it, things happen to it. But it is better than when we first started. That's what we want to admit, uh, to acknowledge that it's better. I remember, oh, it was a real problem. But uh, we can always improve. There's always room for improvement. Chief, Absolutely. is the uh, the therapeutic mental health van? Is that a fire department event? Uh, vehicle? No, it's Depart- LA County Department of Mental Health. Oh, LA County. Okay. They staff it with three people. They have a driver, a caseworker, and a mental health professional. Uh, we launched the first van from Fire Station 4 on Sunday. Uh, there's four other vans that and staff that we're waiting to implement after we debug the first van. Uh, the it's only had two, this is the third day it's been in operation. So we're learning things every day. And once we're confident we can move forward, we'll bring online the other four vans. So it's LA County, but they'll be state store, stationed at a fire station. Yes, the, they'll be running out of five of our fire stations. They're plugged into our, our CAD dispatch computer at uh, Metro. So when a call comes in, uh, we're going to send our resource first. And when our people get on scene, they can assess the patient and determine if they meet the criteria for the mental health ban. Then we send the mental health ban a non-emergency to um, transfer the patient. Oh, that's wonderful. Something really needed. That's great. Sounds exciting. We'll have to hear about another. It's not on the agenda, but since you mentioned it, I had to work it in. Uh, Madam Madam President, (laughs) we we do have it. I do believe it's scheduled for the next meeting. Oh, great. Oh, that's the one. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, very good. Is there, um, if there are no further comments, a motion is in order to receive and move to recommend to receive and file. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, it's been moved and second that we receive and file BFC 22-013. Ms. Gomez? Woods Gray? Aye. Hara? Aye. Ivara? Aye. Ninper? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And I think item E is probably with Chief Graham also, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, okay, very good. Thank so you. Item, item E is just a verbal report uh, update on our, our COVID numbers uh, as we broke down in previous meetings. So as you may recall, we have a total number of department employees listed as 3787, 3787. Of that number, there are 3,178 members that are fully vaccinated. The percentage on that is right around 84%. Very good. Um, the there are some new employees in there that are part of the new employee number that we don't have a record for, just under two percent, about seventy-one people. Um, those account for some of the rookies or some of the recruits that are entering the drill tower. So we're just waiting for that to catch up. Um, uh, we have four hundred and seventy-six uh, pending exemptions that have been requested. Um, 95 of those exemption requests are from fully vaccinated members, and 381 of those members are not fully vaccinated. Of that 381 number, um, there are 319 religious requests or requests for religious exemption, 51 requests for medical exemption, mm-hmm. and there's 11 that have requested for both medical and religious beliefs. Um, so as we go down the list a little bit further, we go back to the fully vaccinated number of 3178. Of that number, if you combine that number with the number of uh, exemption requests from non-vaccinated members, which is 381, that gives you a number of 3559. And those are members that we would look at as compliant to the ordinance. So that's about 94% that are compliant to the ordinance. Um, We had 334 members that were given notice to comply with the ordinance. Um, 94 of them 
became compliant before we had to place them off duty. 240 of those members were placed off duty at one time. And of that number, 212 became compliant and they returned to duty. Mm. So that Very left good. us, so that leaves us with 28 members that are currently on unpaid administrative leave and they're being processed as well. Um, so right now, to, as of this morning, we do have some members that are off in isolation and um, uh, we have uh, today was 27 members are isolation uh, with the infection. Um, hmm. 17 members in addition, 17 members have not been able to return to duty yet. Um, uh, and so they're working through it. And one member um, is unable to return to duty, but he uh, returned to duty in a light duty capacity. Um, hmm. And, and uh, as you recall, we've had two members die from the, from the COVID-19 um, mm-hmm. uh, disease or, or you know, infection. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, going back some time. So those are the updated numbers for today. Um, if you have any questions about that, I can update you further, but that's it. Hmm. Sounds like the department's moving in the right direction. Are there other comments from uh, other uh, commissioners? Commissioner Bar, uh, Commissioner Bar, Commissioner Nimberg, I see your hand. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Commissioner Nimber. Uh, Thank you. Um, so can you, where are we at? Thank you for this. I appreciate it. Um, where are we at with the religious and medical exemptions? Um, per, is personnel doing? Yeah. It's right. personnel, like where is that? And how many are they processing? Have any process been processed? Right. So we have um, the process is really uh, it's a tiered process. So the departments have been asked to do a um, a preliminary uh, uh, review, uh, and then that includes an interview process. So we have I think we have three or four groups of people that are going through our numbers, interviewing the members that have put in for exemptions. That's the first level. Um, The results of that information is passed along to the personnel department, and there's a group of subject matter experts that review the exemption requests at that time. They're doing it for the whole city. So as they receive them from departments, and I don't know what priority order they're going in of the personnel department, but they're taking them in from all departments. So as they get them, that group will review and make an assessment as to whether to approve or deny that exemption request. If somebody is to, if somebody gets an approval, let's say, um, then that would require them to go to a reasonable accommodation process in which the department would look to see what reasonable accommodations could be made for that individual, keeping in mind all of the restrictions that are in place. If they are denied that exemption request, then the person that put in for the exemption could appeal that denial um, and they, well, they have two options. They could actually, if they get denied, they will have time to get vaccinated and become compliant to the ordinance. The other option is to file for an exemption or file for an appeal. And that appeal would come back to the general manager of the department, the fire chief. Um, at that time, the appeals will be considered. Um, again, if that appeal is denied, the member would have time to go ahead and become compliant. Um, and that would, that would be a vaccination at that time. So that's kind of the process as it goes through. Our people have been doing that first phase for the last couple of weeks now. They've been doing several interviews a day to work through those numbers, processing those members that have made those requests, and we're, we're sending that information to the personnel department. I don't have an update on the priority order in which their personnel department is going to process the thousands of requests they're getting citywide departments, but uh, as they come in, we'll be processing them as well, depending on where they are in the, pro- in, the, in the system. Do you know how many, thank you, do you know how many we've sent over to personnel? Uh, I don't have that number right now, but I know they've done about, they've done at least two or three weeks of interview processing. I can get that number for you of how many to date we've sent over. I think they still have a couple more weeks to go, so I don't want to even guess. I was going to say halfway through, but I don't want to guess. I mean, that's that's fair. <laughs> 
but so you okay but you expect to be done with this process maybe like in the next couple of weeks i um, think uh, i'll have to talk to the folks that are doing it uh i would say if i recall right they were talking about end of march is when they would probably get through everybody because okay. there's a lot of scheduling and yeah. um you know and not all the interviews uh, well the interviews have been um uh, i think they've been doing each group has been doing about eight or ten a day i think so they're powering through them okay great excellent that would be um yeah just trying to understand where we're at in the process how long this is going to take and you know yeah no i appreciate it thank you yes ma'am okay uh, any other commissioners with concerns questions comments chief uh Ever, thank you very much for all that information you gave us. I mean, you broke it down in so many different categories and ways that was clear to understand. But I'm really happy to hear that the department seems to be moving in the right direction. And hopefully others out there will. Uh, now that the vaccines have been actually officially approved, they're no longer uh, what tests. Uh, they are approved as vaccines. I'm wondering if and hoping that that will help some people to go and get the vaccine because now it's not experimental. It's really a vaccine that we are, are trusting. And uh, so that, that I hope will help some people uh, because some people said that's what they were waiting on. So let's see if, if that works. Okay, uh, Commissioner Amber. Yes, uh, as far as recruits coming in, are we, what is the policy for recruits? Is they come in vaccinated. Okay, so vaccinated for COVID-19, that is requirement? Yeah, okay. it's part of the city ordinance, so they come in. So. Oh, perfect, that's all. Thank you. Very good, very good. Thank you, Chief Graham Everett, uh, for the uh, report. Um, do we, it's a uh, verbal report, so we don't really have anything to do with on that particular one. Um, we're at the end of our agenda. Is there a motion to uh, join the meeting? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we have the adjournment of our meeting. Ms. Gomez. Woods Gray. Aye. Hara. Aye. Ibarra. Aye. Ninberg. Aye. May adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the, the staff and the, uh, for the department. And uh, thanks to all the commissioners who attended. Uh, we, I've I think had a very, I like robust discussions. So that was good. I like those to bring out information. Uh, so let's have a great two weeks and let's celebrate those Rams. Woo, woo. And uh, go on to a victory. And then don't forget that, that we have, I don't know if we'll have a Chinese New Year's parade. Dr. Har, have you heard? I know I won't be there, but if they have one, but I know that the lunar year is starting. So <laughs> I haven't heard. Well, we're missing another parade. We love parades. I'll be glad when they, this thing is over so we can get into the parades again. Okay, everybody have a great two weeks. Thank you.